thank you everyone for joining us today in our actually last webinar uh, from the series of Exonius. Yes, I know it's a shame, uh, but uh, if you didn't see the previous one, they're all available on the Exclusive Networks YouTube channel. So what we already covered with Exonius is, is how they can help you with NIST 2, so everything from a compliance uh, perspective, but also our session about agent coverage, um, looking at, okay, how are EDRs deployed? What is the adoption rate? Do, do we still see some gaps uh, in our security environment? Uh, and then the latest one was about attack service management. Uh, the name says it's for itself. And then now our last one is uh, how to handle all those zero days out there. But before we're going to talk about zero days, we're going to talk about vulnerabilities. Because no, right. Uh, because numbers uh, tell us that we are what we already know. There are a lot of vulnerabilities out there, and the common vulnerabilities and exposures are increasing as well in numbers as diversity. So while the severity is not increasing or decreasing, since the absolute numbers are increasing, we will have more and more critical CVEs out there. Uh, especially if you look at the hyperstructure of today, uh, the attack surface also expands, so not only on-prem, but also for clouds. So again, more vulnerabilities because larger attack surface. Uh, so there's a need in, in a different way to, to handle those uh, vulnerabilities uh, with more intelligence, more context, so we can triage and, and see, okay, what is now most important? So this one is a very cool uh, graph that actually show you how many CVEs are published each week. Um, this is one from a session of RSA I followed a couple of months ago, and those guys are really were into numbers, and and they pulled everything that they see, and what they said, okay, by 2023 we see an average of 500 CVEs each week, so that's a huge amount of possible exploits because a CVE is not the same as an exploit. A CVE can be exploited, but we still see a lot of difference in that. Um, but again, 500 CVEs means 500 possible exploits, so a lot of ground to cover. Um, but to know what to patch first, first of all, you have to know what is running in your environment. So have an idea what software is installed is a first step. Next step would be actually installing vulnerability tools uh, and with, with the right management tools, of course, and um, a combination of agents, but also network tools to really increase that coverage to make sure you don't have that gap. So that would be a great start, that, that you have all the inf possible information from agents and network tools all in one place. Uh, but then again, you also want to add context to that because you have to know what to patch first. Uh, one question was from a person also in that session is, okay, where do we draw the line? Do we need to patch everything with a severity score of seven and higher or what do you propose? Uh, and the answer was, there is no right number because uh, a number seven in your environment could be a number 10 in another environment because how critical is that system for you? Is that publicly exposed or not? So that's a context you need because it depends on the environment and also depends on the vulnerability itself because it could be a high vulnerability but very difficult to exploit which means a lot of more sophisticated attackers uh, need to handle that specific vulnerability to uh, expose, uh, exploit that. So most of the time a vulnerability is found and the vendor is involved and they can patch it before all the info comes out. But not all the time, because what if the info comes out that there's a vulnerability and there's no patch yet? That's the moment we're gonna say, okay, let's talk about the zero day. With a zero day, there's no patch yet, but already it could be and can be exploited in the wild. So in 2022, we saw 55 different uh, zero days, uh, and this is a very cool graph of uh, Mandiant, which would you say, okay, let's split it up. What is the tech surface here? Uh, mobile, uh, desktop OS browsers, etc. And then more specific, which uh, type of OS and stuff like that. Um, so it gives you a good overview about, okay, those zero days that were actually being exploited. Um, so with a zero day, you need to have a workaround until the patch is released. So you need to be able to quickly identify your um, uh, exposure for, that zero, so for those zero days. Um, unfortunately, that's not the only problem. Uh, we see that in a modern day application, it's over 147 different open source components, meaning they all depend on open source components in the back. So you have to have more detail about that because if one of those components are also vulnerable, 
uh, you expose yourself to it with the software you are using. That is why in the US they actually made an executive order um, with a big impact on cybersecurity because it's really more specific for the software security in the supply chains and their credo is security by design. So from the moment an application is being developed, security should be involved and in the right way. Uh, because a few years ago when software was developed, uh, they developed a product, they delivered it, and that's it, okay? Um, there was no updates. Um, maybe once or twice they did a most critical update, but that's it. Uh, and that's just not the way to do it. Um, so you need to know, okay, they develop software, and what's my exposure? What is that software bill of material to know what dependencies are out there? And that's why the SBOM is getting so important to give you that full visibility of the software you are using because you bought it from a vendor and you're hoping that they keep it that up to date and you just hope that actually all those components that they use are also up to date. Um, and, and open source vulnerabilities continue to rise year over year. Uh, and if they use open source software, they need to patch it um, and all those dependencies uh, involved. A popular way to use that, that uh, to exploit those dependencies is if you want to do a supply chain attack. So if I'm an attacker uh, and you can exploit a third party vendor, that would be great as an attacker because in that way you have access to all the customers of that vendor. Uh, in that way you can scale up to a thousand or, or more customers, uh, which has a huge impact because you're running inside the, uh, the application of that vendor and it's also very hard for EDRs uh, and, and other technologies to detect that, uh, that it's being exploited. And I think that the best example we had last year was Log4j. So Log4j came out at the end of 2021. So it was uh, called by CBS News. So this is mainstream media, not something specific about cybersecurity, but in mainstream media, they say, okay, this is a nightmare before Christmas because there's a vulnerability out there. It's easy, very easy to exploit. So you don't need to be a, an advanced adversary. Uh, every kid on his uh, attic can do this. Uh, so easy to exploit and widespread. Because why? And it was a library, a logging library used for almost every Java based application. Uh, and almost every organization in the world was using this, but they, they know they were using it, but they didn't know where exactly. So they did not have the visibility to know, am I vulnerable? Because I have no idea where it's running. And we can still see that because one year later, there's still a lot of attacks using Log4j because not everything is being patched. Um, and I think that brings us to the question, how fast can we act when a new critical exploit is out there? Because patching is one thing, but what if you don't know what to patch? And this is why Cedric can now talk about how Exonis can help you with that. Yes, so before we continue, let us let me actually ask you a question. How fast can you respond to new zero days? And I don't want to be too optimistic, but in fact, you need two things to be able to rapidly respond to new zero days. First of all, visibility. If you don't have visibility, you don't know what's going on in your environment, and then you need a way to control and take action based on what you see. And that is exactly what we will show you today with Exodus. So let me ask you a couple of questions. First of all, do you know where your assets are? Do you know where your users are? And do you know what user is using what assets? In addition to that, do you know where your data is? We all know that today it's really hard to understand our attack surface because we have workloads running in the cloud. We have different type of workstations all around the world. We have a whole bunch of servers and databases. And you want to make sure once again to understand your attack surface. So how are you going to do that? Because once again, you have all those assets dispersed across your environment. You have different users, administrators and service accounts managing those different sources. And you have a lot of data going from one server to a database to another service into the cloud. So today I want to focus on this simple workstation because we use it all day, everyone. And in fact, we think it's very secure at the moment we install a security tool. But that's not the case because an operating system in general, a workstation, each workstation has an operating system. And most of the time, the attacker will try to compromise your operating system because all other components are on that operating system. 
So an operating system can have different vulnerabilities that might be exploited by attackers, but attackers can also use other tactics and techniques to compromise your operating system, such as deploying malware, viruses, phishing campaigns, etc. There are a lot of other components that might be vulnerable as well, such as the software that's running on top of your operating system, any kind of application, your network interface card, but also ports that are potentially open and can be exploited by attackers. But also the user, think about it. If you do not have strong authentication in place, no multi-factor or second factor, well then of course the users will be a target for those attackers as well. So what you want to make sure is actually understand your environment to then verify that you have proper security in place. And typically what you want to make sure is that your operating system and all the software you are running on those operating systems is up to date. That way you are potentially avoiding certain attacks and certain vulnerabilities to be exploited, but also you make sure that the security tools are all installed and of course updated. Make sure that you have proper vision regarding to authentication. Do I have strong passwords? Password change every eighth month. Do I have multi-factor solution in place, etc. But you can go much more granular and check for, for instance, do my assets have disk encryption enabled? Do I have assets publicly faced, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And this is all what you can learn using Exodus. So before I show you how we can use Exodus to detect those vulnerabilities, and more importantly, what are the assets and users involved by those attacks? Well, let's take a look at some example of zero days. Stan mentioned it previously. A zero day is in fact referring to the moments between we need to actually detect a new threat and we actually find a new solution to remediate against that threat. That time window refers to a zero day. So if we take a look at some zero day vulnerabilities that have been released this year and last year, an example of that is the Windows IKE protocol. And this vulnerability is really critical because it's very easy to exploit. And in addition to that, no user interaction is required. By the way, this vulnerability allows remote code execution. So this is typically something you want to patch pretty fast. Another example would be the COM Plus event system service elevation of privilege vulnerability that allowed an attacker with much more experience to actually exploit this vulnerability. But the problem with this zero day is that it was affecting all Windows versions, so from Windows 7 up to Windows 11. Of course, there are a lot of more examples that I could show you, but just keep in mind that the operating system, the software, as well as mobile devices can be vulnerable to those kind of vulnerabilities. If you want to know more, please go to the Axonius blog portal where you'll have a whole bunch of different articles and ports regarding to those vulnerabilities and zero days. Okay, remember I told you the first step to respond to zero days is having visibility. If you watch our previous sessions, you will learn, you will now know that the first step is actually to configure adapters. That's the way how you can get information from your environment. In this demo environment, I have a couple of solutions in place, and more importantly, I have five different EDR and EBB solutions. It might depend on the location or the acquisition. Uh, that has been made recently. So you can see in this demo environment, about five EDR and EPP solutions are deployed. They are now all integrated with Exonus. So that means that if I go to the device, uh, to the, the, the dashboard, sorry, you will have a nice overview of all the devices and users being discovered in your environment. What's pretty important here is that you can have a list of all the single point solutions that you have integrated with Exonus as well as the total unique devices and total unique users that have been seen in your environment. And based on that information, you now have an up-to-date asset inventory list and you will be able to start creating some queries to know a bit more about your environment and more importantly, to take action. This example shows pretty easy how many devices in my environment are missing an EDR or EPP solution. So we can see that out of the 4,800 devices, I have 855 devices that are not compliant. 
But of course, 855, that's a lot. What are you going to do with all those devices? Well, you have a couple of options here. You can tag the device, you could add a custom field to that device, or you take, could take an action through the enforcement center. Typically, an action would be to send an email to an administrator, send a Slack notification, or take a more direct action by integrating with your existing solution. But let's try to focus on how we can prioritize those devices. Well, we have a couple of options here, and one of them is a new feature that has been released in Exonus, and it's called the Asset Graph. The Asset Graph gives you a nice overview, a very visual overview of what's going on with your assets, what users are connected to the assets, types of vulnerabilities and software that are running on the asset, as well as protocol ports and much more. I will come back to this asset graph later on. But for now, let's try to kind of drill down those assets a bit more. And we can see that we can also filter based on vulnerabilities that might be uh, detected on those assets. So we can see that we went from 855 vulnerable or non-compliant devices to 102 non-compliant and vulnerable devices. And we could have some more granular control and look for specific vulnerabilities with a specific severity, such as you can see on this slide. And you can also drill down to look at specific devices that do not have disk encryption enabled. They might have a public IP, so meaning that they are publicly uh, exposed. And we can see that we went from a list of 855 devices to a list of four devices, more particularly four servers that are pretty vulnerable and represent that's very high risk in our environment. If you do want to learn more about an asset, well, simply click on the device profile. And if you follow the previous sessions, you will see that there is some difference in the look and feel of the UI, but the information still remains the same. So we have aggregated fields and predefined or preferred fields. And we also have a list of pre-generated uh, tabs, such as a list of open ports, network interfaces, and this is pretty important, a list of software installed on that endpoint. If you have a list of software that is installed on the endpoint, you will be able to use Exonius to identify vulnerabilities. You might have a VA tool as well that is reporting some vulnerabilities, but keep in mind that at the moment you send a list of software installed on an endpoint, Exonius will be able to identify vulnerabilities linked to that asset. And I will show you that later on. But let's go back to Log4G. You can use Exonus to hunt for Log4G. And I just want to show you kind of different ways you can take to actually uncover assets that are potentially vulnerable to Log4G. The first option is to look for specific software that contains Log4G. The other option, if the vulnerability is known, you can search for the CVE ID. And the last option is actually to look for specific software that you already know that it is containing the Log4G library, such as Apache, Elastic, or even Minecraft. So that way you are pretty easy, if you are sure, very simple steps to identify all the assets with those vulnerabilities. But if you are interested in vulnerabilities, I highly recommend you to go to the vulnerabilities tab. There, rather than having a list of all devices, you will have a list of all vulnerabilities in your environment. And you have two things here that are pretty nice to highlight. The first one is the vulnerability ID, which is in fact a link. So if you click on that, you will be redirected to the NIST website. And the second column is called device count. And if you click on such device count, you will be redirected to the device tab and have a look at all the devices that have that specific vulnerability. In the vulnerability tabs, you can also use the query wizard to fine tune a bit more and look for specific vulnerabilities. And you have two options here. You can add a device query, such as we done at the beginning, to look for specific devices that are missing an EDR or an EPP solution. And then on top of that, you can build some queries specific to the vulnerabilities. How does Axonis identify those vulnerabilities? Well, as I mentioned, at the moment, you can give or provide Axonis a list of software that is running on that asset. Axonis will use that information and compare that to the NIST MVD and CISA CAV catalog. 
And based on that information, Axonius is able to provide you very accurately and very rapidly um, new vulnerabilities in your environment. And you can see that on this slide, we have some very critical vulnerabilities that have been detected by Axonius Static Analyst Engine only, even if in our environment we have some other VA tools that are up and running. You can see that on this slide as well. And this slide shows, in fact, some very critical vulnerabilities linked to a Chromium zero day of last year. And to be more precise, in fact, last year, more than four zero days were released uh, concerning Chromium. And those four zero days actually allowed an attacker to execute some remote code execution. So those vulnerabilities is typically something you want to patch very rapidly or at least identify the assets that are vulnerable to those kind of vulnerabilities. So how do we remediate? Well, we have a couple of options here. The first one is to create a query in the device tab and search for all the assets that have a specific Chromium version. But the second option is actually to go to a new tab that has been released in action. It's called the software tab. And the software tabs shows you a nice overview of all the different software, as well as the software version. You can add some specific tags as well. So you have a nice list of all the software in your environment. And then again, you can use the query wizard to start fine tuning and looking for specific devices only. So here I'm showing four softwares, four browser software that in fact are unsanctioned, so not approved and that are running and installed on specific servers. So you can see that that way we are pretty, again, fast and precisely able to identify the assets with specific vulnerabilities or specific softwares. And as I mentioned, the asset graph is also a nice way to rapidly identify specific software, users that might be connected to that endpoint, as well as specific vulnerabilities. But don't worry, I will show you how to use the asset graph later on as well. But you can also take action. So at the moment you have a query that has some results, I highly recommend you to save that query because you will be able to use that query later on. You can use that query to create some dashboards and reports, but you could also use that query to take an action through the enforcement center. In this example, at the bottom, you can see the query that is used by this enforcement. It's actually looking for all assets with two specific open ports and in addition to that, assets that do not have a VA tool nor an endpoint and protection solution. And the action is configured at the top, so we can see non-compliant Slack notification. However, underneath, you can see that we have three different actions that will be enforced. The first one is actually to send a message over to the administrator. The second action will create a ServiceNow ticket. And the third action will actually integrate with Tenable, the VA tool we have in our environment. Okay, we talked a lot about user uh, devices. Let's talk a bit more about the users because as I mentioned, the user can also be a source of attack. So if you take a look at the asset graph, first of all, you can see the device that is concerned. We can see what vulnerabilities are associated with that device. But more importantly, we could investigate and learn more about the user. So we could take a look at, for instance, that specific user, what other devices is he connecting to, or what other server is he managing? So once again, the asset graph, a really good new feature, by the way, that will help you rapidly investigate your environments. Another thing you want to make sure if we are talking about users is that, of course, users have strong passwords, multi-factor authentication, EIM solutions in place, etc. So if we go to the users tab, we can start looking for specific users that might be connecting to multiple devices, or we might be interested for specific queries to look at the strength of the passwords. So on this slide, we can see a couple of examples of queries you can create to look for vulnerable or compromised users. Okay, let me walk you through kind of a demo of how we can use the enforcement center to add our custom risks risk score and this is pretty interesting because you can add a custom field to an asset so to show you that i will actually click on the dashboard because it is interactive and i will be redirected to the device tab and this will show me a list of 29 devices 
that all have a risk score between 50 and 75. So if I go to the device profile and I start looking for the risk score, you will see this device has a risk score of 69.6. Well, you should ask me, why does that device has a risk score of 69? Well, in the enforcement center, we have created a couple of actions that says, hey, look, start searching for active devices that have been seen in the last 30 days that have a vulnerability, but they do not have a VA tool. If that's the case, take the highest vulnerability and add that score to the risk score of this asset. So if I go now to the asset graph of one of the assets that might have some vulnerabilities as we can see here, three different vulnerabilities, you might be interested in the severity of the vulnerability, but also on what kind of other assets that vulnerability has been seen. So you can see that using the asset graph, we are rapidly able to identify all the assets, all the users uh, involved in such vulnerabilities. So let me finish this, uh, my part with talking you, walking you through the new dashboards that Axonis has introduced. In fact, Axonis has introduced a lot of new features uh, this last month. And we are now able to use predefined templates to build our dashboard. So making it very easy. And in this example, we can see that we have a predefined dashboard for log 4 chat. Another pretty nice thing is that we also have predefined tab dashboards having trained. So we have entire pages for discovering OT environments, EIM solutions, general device inventory, but also some more specific ones, such as here for the security operations center where you can have a nice overview of the agent coverage, as well as how compliant your devices are. All right, thank you, Cedric, right on time. Um, so I think this actually sums it all right, uh, quite well. If you look at the dashboards, that all the info that we provide with Axonius, they can really help you um, optimize your risks, make sure you have your right priorities straight. If there's zero day, how fast can you check your coverage? Make sure you have all that context uh, in one single place and then go on. Because that's the the most value is that context, right? If you only have that vulnerability assessment tool, it gives you an idea, okay, this patch is not installed yet, but that's it. Axonis can provide more context. We have information from the uh, VA tool, we have information from the EDR tool, information about the network tool. So more context gives you more an idea how to make your priorities straight and then move forward with uh, the right strategy. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're coming up at 16.30, so right on schedule. Uh, if there are questions, you can put them in the chat box. If not, I uh, wish you a pleasant day and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've got a question uh, from the CISO. How, how can CISO use the risk score? Yeah, so as I showed you, we can use the enforcement center to add a custom risk score. But afterwards, you are also able to create other queries to look for that specific risk score. So imagine you have a risk score of 69. Well, if you create an enforcement that says, hey, look, search for all the devices with a risk score above 50 and then quarantine them, for instance, or send that information to the UNDR solution, to the EIM solution, etc. So based on this custom risk score, you will be able to take actions later on as well. All right, thanks. Uh, another question is, do I still need a vulnerability assessment tool? Um, I can take this one. Yes, you will still need it. The benefit with Exxon is just that we can just uh, aggregate more information. We, we, we have the collector in place, like a vulnerability tool, like an EDR. We put them at one place, we build more context around it, but you still need that tool. So, okay, that's it from questions. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, until next time, goodbye.